Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event, Movies Are Prayers. Great to have you with us. My name's Tim. I'll be your host for this evening. And a very special welcome to you if this is your first LICC event. It should be a good one. We should have some fun together and hopefully it will give you some thought provoking content to chew on along the way. Let me tell you a little bit about why we decided to run this event this evening. At LICC, we believe there's no such thing as a sacred secular divide, as if some religious parts of life matter more to God than everything else. No, the life of discipleship, of following Jesus, of being a Christian embraces all of life, the work we do, the food we eat and the movies we watch. Living with that conviction is a beautiful thing, but it can raise lots of questions about how we show up as Jesus followers in our culture. And this week in the shadow of the Oscars 2021, we thought it would be a good time to press into some of those tricky questions. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Josh Larson this evening. Josh has been writing and speaking about movies professionally for over 25 years. He's recently published a book by the same name of tonight's event, Movies Are Prayers. And in his work at the Chicago Sun-Times, his blog and his podcasts, Josh models a gospel affected approach to film that I am sure you're gonna find entertaining, perhaps challenging, and as I said, certainly thought provoking. So without further ado, I'll get out of the way. Over to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Tim. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving some time this evening to join us, be part of presentation and discussion about movies. Should be a good time. I um, think this is my first transatlantic seminar of any sorts that I have done. So um, kind of exciting to have that opportunity. I've been able to visit London uh, twice, but um, this is new <laughs> to speak with you from my home here in Chicago. So really grateful that uh, Tim extended the invitation and we've been able to figure this out. Tim's going to be my operator of sorts. Uh, my screen sharing wasn't functioning as we got started here. So just a heads up that um, as we get into the presentation, uh, he will be driving that for me as I speak with you. And uh, I'm really eager to be part of the breakout rooms and to get to that Q&A at the end when I do these sorts of events. Those are the fun parts for me. <laughs> I've, I've long ago gotten sick of hearing myself speak, but um, I do love hearing how others are processing these ideas and just what others love about film, my passion to hear um, your favorite movies and how you're thinking about the cinema. So hopefully that will be what we do tonight. We are breaking this up in three sections. At the beginning here will be something that touches more on what Tim was just talking about, uh, this sacred secular non-divide uh, and how that applies to us in terms of engaging with culture, popular culture in general. The second section will be based on the book, Movies Are Prayers, um, a practical approach to doing that sort of thing when it comes to film. And then we'll get to the Oscars in the third section where we'll get to have some fun. I'll break down some background information from you for you, talk about some of the nominees, um, and then we'll have the Q&A. So I wanna start um, you know, saying how comfortable I feel already with this group, uh, learning about the Institute and looking at some of the, um, the vision statements uh, that uh, are there on the website. Uh, I captured this phrase, that the Institute looks to empower Christians to make a difference for Christ in our Monday to Saturday lives. And I do think that those hours that we spend from Monday to Saturday, the non-church hours, let's say, uh, those are increasingly consumed for many of us, not everyone, but for many of us by popular culture. We are swimming in it. Uh, it is everywhere. If uh, there was a time where Christians chose to be separate from those elements of the world, um, it was far easier than it is today when once you pick up your phone, you're kind of already entering that universe. So it's very important, I think, for Christians now more than ever to have some sort of understanding of how they're going to incorporate their faith with movies, with television, with music, uh, podcasts, uh, games, video games. These are all sorts of things that we write about at my day job where I'm editor for the website Think Christian. Interestingly, Tim, I don't think this came up, but our slogan is no such thing as secular <laughs> for Think Christian. So we're very aligned here. Um, but as you said, it's important to think, it's one thing to have that understanding, but what does that practically mean? How do we go about living into that? Um, and in this digital age, the sheer access to pop culture um, has just increased exponentially. The amount of popular culture being produced has increased. In the time that I've been a critic, 
I am just awash in people wanting me to watch their movies these days because there are just so many more movies out there. I think back to, you know, when I was growing up in the age of the VHS and the early days of cable, and that seemed to just explode the world, the possibilities. And that was nothing compared to what we have now. Um, so this is really something that's a pertinent question for the church, but at the same time is a question that was addressed way back in the early church, something at the very beginning when the first Christians had to decide, how are we going to relate to the culture that is out there um, as a people of faith? So let's get into that. And uh, we'll start talking about Christian pop cultural engagement in particular. And there's one question I kind of want to ask. Um, do we look at this as a gift? Do we look at pop culture as a gift or do we look at pop culture as a danger? Now, in my lifetime and in the States, and I'll be very curious to hear from some of you later how it might have differed uh, in the UK, but in the States, this question has been, has been discussed in terms of the culture war. That's the term that has been given it, right? The culture war. So for many Christians in the US, primarily of the evangelical persuasion, I would say, um, popular culture is something to be feared and something to be policed first, not necessarily something to be enjoyed. Um, I was certainly familiar with those attitudes growing up. Um, some of the churches uh, that I was a part of, uh, some of the other organizations that I was a part of growing up as a, as a young Christian. But at the same time, I was fortunate that I grew up in a home where fear wasn't the first posture that we took. Uh, my parents loved movies. The, they loved the arts in general. We spent a lot of time taking advantage of the cultural opportunities in a great city like Chicago. And so while they were discerning, and I certainly had rules going back to the days of cable, um, I was the kid who didn't have MTV on my block. Uh, so I was a little out of it in, in that sense, but, um, but we weren't afraid. I wasn't taught to be afraid of these things. It was more to be discerning. So I do feel fortunate that I was very familiar with these culture wars, um, but not necessarily mired in them. Um, so I think along with my reformed background, which we'll talk a little bit about how reformed theology plays a part in this, um, I was able to have a little different perspective of what it is like to engage with popular culture and the movies in particular. So I wanna present a framing question um, for the evening. If we understand that Christians have a, a biblical mandate to create and participate in culture, and I'm gonna spend some time looking at scripture about that mandate, but if we do understand that we have this biblical cultural mandate, what if we approached it as a gift to enjoy rather than a burden to bear? So let's, let's start with some scripture here and, and jump in and look at this cultural mandate. I want, I want to hold two passages um, in our hands at the same time, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. Uh, this first one is probably what you are familiar with as the cultural mandate from Genesis 1. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. So let's hold that in one hand as we also look ahead to the New Testament to Philippians 4 verse 8. Um, this is uh, another verse that uh, comes up in a lot of conversations, has for me, when we talk about how Christians should engage with popular culture. And I think it relates to uh, the biblical cultural mandate that we were given. Philippians were told, finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So we have here two sections of scripture addressing the cultural mandate. And again, I, I, I want us to think about what it would look like if we approach this as a gift to enjoy, not a responsibility to bear. It has been my experience um, that this responsibility, this burden turns many Christians into the culture police. And what I mean by that is when it comes to a movie or a song or a TV show, 
sometimes we immediately assume a negative posture right at the beginning. And what that means is we, we start with negative questions that we bring to the table when we encounter a piece of pop culture. Um, we'll ask, what's offensive here? And how do we determine that? Well, we have this handy list, right, called the Ten Commandments. So we could go right down them, hold them against this TV show and say, okay, which of these are being broken? And you can see how that's immediately a negative posture. We can also start with a question that I do think is a good question to ask, but I don't know that needs to be the beginning question. And that is, does anything in this piece of pop culture challenge a Christian worldview? So immediately we're kind of setting up this debate scenario in our minds if we take this policing posture. And the third one can, can be kind of manipulative, actually. We ask, well, how might this piece of pop culture harm me? Or to get especially manipulative, we'll say, is this bad for the children? Um, frequently you'll hear the children are brought out as uh, we must protect them from this pop culture. What I'd like to suggest is that that sort of fearfulness, that sort of posture is very different from um, what we see, what's described in Genesis. If we look back at the cultural mandate there, we see that the cultural mandate is described in positive terms, really. Um, phrases like be fruitful, uh, phrase like multiply, these are expansive terms. These aren't, uh, these aren't restrictive terms. Even something like I have given you every plant yielding seed that, that is like a, a, a casting out, um, a gift, again, sense of culture that we're given. And I do think even those elements here that, um, that could be seen as uh, in negative terms, so something like dominion or subdue, those words, really they're used here in pursuit of flourishing, not, not in uh, pursuit of conquering in that sense. I don't know if you're familiar with Andy Crouch, um, but he has a fantastic book called Culture Making that has been very formative to me in thinking about some of these things. And in culture making, he has this remarkable exploration of the cultural mandate right along these positive lines. So I wanna read a quote from Crouch here. Creation at its best leaves us joyful, not jaded. It prompts delight and wonder, even in the creators themselves who marvel at the fruitfulness of their small efforts. So again, I think what you're seeing here um, is just this sense of uh, um, a biblical call for the cultural for cultural engagement not to be one of policing. It's it's not to declare what is good or bad for all the world. That's not our burden. I think we're more called to be something better described as cultivators, uh, and by that I mean creators, sometimes ourselves of this culture, but if not that, encouragers of a cultural landscape that is um, that's going to allow for the flourishing that God intended for us. Um, and so you can see how that's a very different sort of posture to take when you do encounter popular culture. Now, there's still a question uh, hanging out there that we do need to address, and that is, what do we do with the culture that does not promote flourishing? This is all well and good if everything we encountered um, is very affirming of, of a, a Christian worldview, is, is very, holds all those qualities in Philippians right there in front of us. And, and as we know, not all popular culture is of that nature. And this is where actually Philippians 4 verse 8 is often thrown back at me. Say if I, um, if I praise a horror movie, perhaps. I've had so many conversations about um, whether Christians should engage with horror movies or anything else really that, which has something that could be called questionable content. Um, someone will say, well, should we be involved with anything that's not true, that's not honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, all of these qualities? And I guess I would say three things um, to that, at least to offer for consideration to that. These qualities are, they're more expansive, I think, than they're often given credit for. So if you look at a few of them, if you look at like truth, honor, justice, these are qualities that aren't exclusive to, um, to Christian content, um, to Christian movies, say, or music. These are qualities that can be found in all sorts of culture um, that is not distinctly Christian. So they're more expansive than sometimes they're given credit for. Second thing that's worth thinking about in terms of this verse is that Philippians as a letter is a letter of joy. Uh, this isn't addressed to a church that is in disarray um, or in crisis. And so that means I think that Paul's instructions can be taken positively, not negatively. Uh, these are qualities to be praised and sought for their, for their inherent goodness 
not necessarily as a refuge uh, from elements that may or may not be harmful. So it's not an either or situation, I guess, is, is what is worth considering there. Um, I had a colleague when we were talking about this once um, make a helpful ob observation about this passage. And she said, you know, Paul is applying these qualities to our hearts, um, not necessarily to what today we would call content. Um, so it's not necessarily a list that was meant to be held up against the content along something like we would do with the Ten Commandments, as I was saying earlier. This is who we should strive to be as people, uh, these qualities. And then the third thing is, um, I do think if we are called to be cultivators beyond our own walls, and so I mean beyond the Christian bubbles that we might find ourselves in, we're going to have to first listen to the culture that is out there. Um, even if it's not pure, even if it's not commendable, uh, perhaps especially we're going to need to do that if it's not quote unquote true, because it's only after we've earned the right to speak, and that's by allowing the culture to have its say, uh, that we're gonna have the best opportunity to offer our Christian witness in response. Now, what does this practically look like for us um, in our in our day-to-day -day lives? Another portion of scripture, I think, gives us a really wonderful novel. And so I want to go to uh, another story here. This from Acts, Acts 8. And uh, this was brought um, to my attention by, and during a sermon I heard a few years ago now, by Denise Kingdom Greer. And in her sermon, she was speaking more about um, relationships in general, particularly evangelism, how evangelism, um, what that might look like for us today. Uh, but I do think it applies to how we might engage with culture as well. So this is the story of Philip, um, his encounter with the Ethiopian. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm sure it's familiar to you. Uh, basically, when Philip was moved by the Spirit to, to seek out the Ethiopian, to, um, to engage with him as he finds this person reading Isaiah in his chariot. In her sermon, uh, Greer she suggested three really interesting things that we could take from this, again, in terms of evangelism, but I would say in terms of cultural engagement. And the first is that this is very much a model that suggests we meet others where they are. Um, very practical way this takes place in this story. Philip goes to the man in his chariot, meets him where he is with the activity he's doing. Um, and, and that's important for us, I think, as Christians, it does mean we will not need to be out in the culture if this is something that is important to us. We're going to have to engage with these movies, these songs, uh, these television shows, and the rest. So meet others where they are. The second um, point we can take as a model here, ask questions. And don't ask leading questions or got you questions. Ask questions and be genuinely interested in the answers. That's definitely what you see Philip doing here. Uh, he, when he asks the Ethiopian, do you understand what you are reading? You sense genuine curiosity there, um, a genuine desire for dialogue. And I think that is what we have to bring into our engagement with pop culture as well. And then the third thing, um, the third way this offers a model to us, I think, is the way it shows the importance of finding common ground first and worrying about barriers later. This goes back to the idea of posture I was talking about. We can take a posture where we sit down before a movie um, and we immediately worry about where we are going to differ from what we see on the screen, what the characters are doing, what we think the, the message of the movie might be, anything like that. Um, but I wonder if we should start by finding common ground as, as Philip does here. And maybe worry, you know, there may be some important distinctions to make at some point, but that's not really what Philip is concerned with. And I love the way this story ends. Um, the question Philip gets, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? Nothing. And I think how different that is where in some churches today, we might say, well, um, let me consult with the church council. We're going to need you to come before the church council. We're going to need you to um, give your testimony. We're going to need you to answer these questions. We're going to, all this stuff needs to happen before we can even talk about baptism. Let's not, let's not get carried away. Um, and here rather, it's almost the reverse. Um, Philip has this dialogue. He welcomes um, 
the Ethiopian into the community of believers. I am sure there are going to be many, many more conversations after this point, um, but they will be based in this relationship that has now been formed. And so again, it's a little different when we're talking about pieces of pop culture than people, but I think some of those principles apply can offer us a helpful model. Now, um, speaking of baptizing, lest you think I'm arguing for um, the baptizing of all popular culture, no matter what is out there, I do want to offer a caveat um, and take a moment to, um, to discuss that. The cultural mandate of Genesis 1, which we just read, it's pre-fall, right? So this is meant for a world without flaws. We do not live in that world. That's not the reality. It's very different from the culture that we live in, very different from the culture, the popular culture that is often produced, um, which is incapable of truly flourishing. Uh, we cannot fulfill the cultural mandate ourselves. Um, what we can do is work toward its fulfillment, which will come through the grace of Christ in the new creation. And that is our calling, is kind of to work towards that at this point. So culture in this, this now but not yet, it's going to be messy. It's just going to be messed up as we are messy and as we are messed up. Um, and so what's going to happen then is we will see glimpses of all those qualities in, four, in Philippians 4 verse 8. Um, we'll touch them here, but they're going to often be right next to some really messy, troubling stuff. That's how we are as people. We hold both of those things in us. And so it makes sense that our culture is going to do the same. Um, you know, we may be told to seek the pure, but does that really exist in our fallen world? I don't, I don't know that it does. And so that's why discernment is still so necessary. And it's an important piece of all of this cultural engagement. Discernment, I also want to um, make the point of saying that it's personal. Um, and so something I like to say whenever I, I give a talk like this and I, I'm discussing this with people, if there's an aspect of culture that for whatever reason, maybe it's one of addiction, maybe it's one of um, temptation or something else, um, proves to be a hindred to your Christian walk, then you're under no mandate to, to participate in it. I'm not giving you this mandate to go and watch every movie that is out there. Um, you're not a worse Christian for saying, that's not for me. I think those, re those restrictions are necessary in our personal discernment. I think we get into trouble when we try to prescribe those personal restrictions for everyone else and say, because this might be a stumbling block for me, cross it out, no one can engage with it. All right, so there's my caveat. I think we're getting to the end of our time here. So let me quickly share one more quote that I found helpful. This is in Thomas Merton's Contemplative Prayer. Again, I'm um, giving it a little different context. Merton here is talking about Christian meditation and, and contemplative prayer itself. But I do think this is another good model for the posture we can take when it comes to Christian cultural engagement. Merton uh, wrote, in meditation, we should not look for, an, for a method or a system, but cultivate, there's that word again, an attitude, an outlook, one of faith, openness, attention, reverence, expectation, supplication, trust, joy. So real quickly here, let me break each of those down um, as separate qualities within this context of engaging with popular culture. And I'll ask you this, can we engage in pop culture with faith? And I would say that is a commitment to God's word. We bring our faith into this, absolutely. Can we engage in popular culture with openness, this willingness to talk to others? Um, can we engage with attention? And that I think can be applied to the aesthetics of popular culture. Can we not get so caught up in the message that we forget to appreciate and think about um, the actual forms that this culture takes, what is on the screen visually, what we hear in the music beyond the lyrics. Um, can we engage in popular culture with reverence? And I think that is reverence for the creative work that has been done, the, the effort people have put into this. Um, can we engage with expectation rather than fear? I'd set that aside from fear. Instead of going in with fear, how about positive expectation? Can we engage in supplication? And by that, I think we should deserve to have a chance to enter the conversation. We should expect that we too get to be a part of this conversation if we've listened to what others have to say as well. Can we engage uh, with trust? The trust that this is all in God's hands. We are not the cultural police. That's not what the mandate was. God's got this covered, okay? Um, so we don't have to put that on ourselves. And lastly, can we engage in 
popular culture with joy. Um, just at the creative capabilities that God has given us, the, the gifts that he's given others who are creating these things and, and us in terms of how we engage with it. Can we bring that joy to it? And I think if we do all of that, we're going to take a very different posture um, than the one we're sometimes, the ones we're sometimes tempted to take, I think. Um, and then here's what you can consider together. What posture were you taught to take toward popular culture growing up? Um, what was that experience like for you? And what's the posture taken by the faith communities you're a part of now? Is it similar to what I've been describing? Is it more like the culture wars um, that, uh, that I've experienced as well? What does it look like for you? And that was the first section. The first session was a lot of, you know, theory, I guess you could say, um, you know, how we can think about engaging with culture. And this is, this session will be practice. It will be an example of one way to do it. Uh, I'm not arguing that everyone needs to think of movies as prayers, but I am arguing that this is one way we can, as Christians, think about film if we'd like to. Um, and it is, you know, a, a, an experiment that turned into a book project for me, uh, an idea, something I, I did put into practice and was able to pursue in book length form. So a couple of years ago, I did um, publish movies, our prayers, and the title basically gives you the idea. I wanted to see if uh, I could look at a wide array of films and consider how they might, fun might function as specific types of Christian prayer. So specific genres, I guess you could say, uh, of prayer. And so I give a chapter to about uh, six different types and then explore a wide array of movies in each of those. So I'm gonna break some of that down here with you in this session and give you a sense um, of what that experience was like and see if it triggers any thoughts for you about how movies you've seen might function in this way. Let's start um, more generally though, and first look at uh, a basic question. What are movies? When, when you just think of a movie, what do you think of? And, and I think maybe the first thing that comes to mind is that movies are escapist experiences. So we need a break take our minds off things. We go to a big theater, or at least we used to, hopefully we'll be able to again soon, and go see a giant lizard fighting a giant ape. Actually, my, my first movie experience since um, almost in a year recently was to see Godzilla versus Kong in an actual theater. And I'm not going to pretend that uh, getting to do that in a theater isn't a huge part of the reason why I actually liked the film. Um, it was great to be back in a theater again. Great to have that sense of escape, which even as a film critic, I feel. So that's one thing that movies can be. Movies can also be historical artifacts. Um, and I have a still here from the 1947, I believe, The Lady from Shanghai, an Orson Welles film noir starring Rita Hayworth, who you see here. And basically, older movies like this are fascinating because yes, you can take them as a story and on their own terms, but they're also snapshots of an earlier era, an earlier style of filmmaking, stars who are no longer with us. Um, how about background information, like the fact that this movie was made at the time of Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles' marriage almost about to be over. How does that play into the screen? All this sort of history. Uh, and of course, the film itself now is a historical document being that old. So movies are also historical artifacts. Another thing they are, which we don't like to think about, but bottom line, they're business ventures. Most movies are made to make money. Um, and that's why we see Godzilla versus Kong. The, the reason we've gotten decades of Godzilla movies um, and, and decades of Kong movies as well, um, I think they're ripe subjects for movies. I love these movies, but also they've all made money. Um, so movies are absolutely business ventures. Then a last, a last category I want to mention is the one that, you know, I like to think of first as a film critic, cinephiles, those of you who love the movies, I think also like to explore them as artistic expressions. Um, and that doesn't set aside those other things. A movie can be both escapist, historical artifact, and a business venture and still be an artistic expression. Um, I think there's lots of artistry at work in Godzilla versus Kong, uh, and I enjoy exploring that. And once you think of movies as being artistic expressions, that kind of opens the window to all sorts of things they can be. You're bringing interpretation into it now. Um, and this is where um, I think there's room to think of movies as possibly being interpreted as prayers. So that's a broad overview of movies. Let's go to a broad overview, very briefly, of prayer. 
And there's an underlying premise to the book for me that prayer is universal. Um, prayer is something that I feel even someone who identifies as an atheist does. Um, everyone longs for things. Everyone yearns for things. Everyone um, experiences lament over things, um, anger as well. And these are all thoughts that are sent out there. And we know that God hears. And so we know that they are essentially prayer. So that's kind of a bottom line foundational understanding of the book. Um, but of course, for those of us who are people of faith, it's more specific than that. And so Christians primarily look to the Lord's Prayer, um, which is found in Matthew 6, the prayer given to us by Jesus, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So an interesting thing about the Lord's Prayer, so succinct, but so much packed in there. You can even see that there are sub genres of prayer, to use that term again, within this prayer. You can see that there's a prayer of praise here. Hallowed be your name. That is praise. There's a prayer of confession. Forgive us our debts. Um, a moment where we bring our sins before God. There's a prayer of obedience here. Um, your kingdom come, your will be done, pledging our obedience to God's kingdom. Um, and those are all, I set aside chapters in the book to each of those as types of prayer, prayers of obedience, confession, praise, and a few others. So what does this look like on screen to bring movies back into it? Well, you can see that we can look at movies like Mean Streets, uh, Harvey Keitel here, the Martin Scorsese film, and we can look at movies where characters literally pray. Uh, and I think that can be fruitful. And there are a handful of such films in the book that I explore, with, which are obviously exploring religious themes. Um, but also, I think you can look at movies wider ranged, um, not specifically religious, and think about how they might function as prayers. And that includes a movie like Godzilla, going all the way back to the original Godzilla. Uh, let's watch a little bit of this trailer for that first film. Godzilla, king of the monsters, whose death ray blasts the city from the face of the earth before your very eyes. Godzilla alive, stalking across the world, crushing all before it. Is Godzilla fantasy or a prophecy of doom? For the answer, see Godzilla, king of the monsters. A tale of horror more fantastic than any ever written by Jules Verne. More terrifying than any ever shown on the screen. Godzilla, king of the monsters. Incredible titan of terror. A story to stop the mind a gargantuan creature of the sea surges up on a tidal wave of destruction to wreak vengeance on the earth. Godzilla, king of the monsters. Fantastic beyond comprehension. Tripping beyond compare. Astounding beyond belief. The mightiest monster of them all. The Godzilla, king of the monsters. How can something like that be considered a prayer? I mean, it's just a creature feature, right? With, um, some would say hokey, I would say mesmerizing special effects, certainly special effects from another era. It helps to remember that um, from the very beginning, and this particularly applies to the Japanese original version of Godzilla Gohira, which came out in 1954, uh, the movie was understood as this metaphor um, referencing the American bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. Um, Godzilla the creature, if you look itself, uh, almost looks like a victim, a burn victim from uh, a bombing, that kind of misshapen uh, skin that Godzilla has. In that original film, the 54 version, the director, Ishiro Honda, after Godzilla has attacked a city, lingers on the aftermath. And so there are tracking shots along a street that's been it's rubble, and there are people sitting mourning on the street. This is a direct call. Um, again, to the bombings, even though it is in this monster movie. Even Godzilla's screech, once you're thinking about the movie this way, that famous notorious cry that Godzilla gives, it's less of a roar to me once you have this context in mind and more of a, more of a cry, more of a lament. And I think you put all that together and Godzilla can be understood as uh, a prayer of lament, really, um, over humanity's appetite for destruction, humanity's continual appetite for destruction. The very origin story of Godzilla, of course, is that the creature was awoken by undersea atomic testing. 
um, off the coast of Japan. And so it's very integral to what this movie is doing. And I think makes the argument for Godzilla as a, as a prayer of lament. Now, if that's a bit of a stretch for you, let, let me give you a little bit of background theology uh, to kind of bolster, bolster my case here. Um, I, I used a lot of the work of uh, Dutch theologian, Abraham Kuyper, uh, in my book. And this is probably the quote Kuyper is most well known for, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all does not cry mine. That is uh, a quote that unfortunately, especially in the last year or so, has been has been kind of hijacked by certain politicians in the U.S. Um, for its triumphalist tones. And you can certainly read that there, but that is not, um, that's not the interpretation of it that I've understood, or I think most theologians have understood. Instead, it's more inclusive. It's, it's acknowledging very much what, what Tim said uh, at the beginning of our time together is that God is sovereign over all. And that means culture is part of this. Popular culture is part of this too. Not to conquer, um, but for us to participate in, again, towards that flourishing, move the kingdom closer towards the flourishing that we expect um, will come one day. Now, Piper, I should say, also um, had this very helpful idea of common grace which is that even those who may not identify as believers have been blessed by God with gifts, gifts of creativity and wisdom. And because of that, in the culture that they produce, we can find hints of God's truth, even if that might not be what they would claim was their intent. So again, it's, it's both expansive and inclusive, this understanding um, of culture that Kuiper brought. I should say that, you know, if you look at Kuiper's read, writings, Closely, he's definitely more focused on the positive. So for him, the ideal art is that which specifically reflects God's glory or points to the glory to come. Um, I'm pushing his notions of common grace, I think, a little bit towards um, so that we can include these other things that artists uh, are doing and the way that they're using their God-given gifts, really, to, um, to lament, to confess, to yearn, uh, essentially to pray. Uh, again, even if that's not what they would claim to be doing. And so I think if you um, understand Kuiper's work that way, it gets you gets you to Godzilla. So let's see, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I have, let's see here. We'll go ahead and move ahead to, there are three types of prayer I was going to break down. I think it might be best for me to skip ahead um, lament and 12 years a slave, yearning and close encounters of third kind. We'll skip past both of those and go to uh, this last one here, joy. Prayers of joy, um, you know, not a category we think of very often, uh, distinct from prayers of praise, I would say. Uh, I have a chapter on each in the book. And what is Christian joy? When we pray with joy, what are we doing? Well, it seems to me that if you look throughout scripture, so from Job to the Psalms to the Hebrews, joy joy is used to describe our gratitude for God's creative prowess. So that's looking backwards at um, the goodness God has done, uh, his creation, and, and experiencing joy over that. But it's also, um, you know, looking forward to his saving grace, grateful for that as well, but also to the full enjoyment of that saving grace in the new creation. Um, so joy is kind of this all-encompassing expression. And where do you find it in the movies? Um, I found myself going to musicals when I was writing this chapter. Um, there are other movies that I include in the chapter on prayers of joy, but I was really drawn to musicals and the joy that we see and experience in them. And one of the best examples, um, I think, comes from Top Hat, one of my favorite Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers movies. There's a remarkable moment near the end where Fred and Ginger are dancing in a ballroom, surrounded by other couples, very elegant, um, you know, a lovely dance sequence, but they're a little cramped. Um, you know, they're, they're, one, they're one couple in the crowd of couples. Eventually, they make their way out to this veranda and there's no one else out there. Uh, they have it to themselves, all sorts of space. And their dance transforms at this moment. They, they really become Fred and Ginger. Um, there's room for, for, for Ginger to twirl, to spin, 
um, and then return to, to Fred. And even this is where costume design comes into play. This, this goes back to when I was talking about the Merton quote and paying attention to the aesthetic details. Um, how can we appreciate that? Yes, even as people of faith. Look at Ginger's dress. You can see it in this, this image here. Um, all those bird feathers on it. When they are dancing in the ballroom and kind of cramped, they, they're just laying down as they are here. But once they get on that veranda and she's able to spin, um, those feathers just lift in the air. And, and you suddenly realize that in, in this moment, it's very much a new creation moment because not only are Fred and Ginger becoming who they were meant to be, but even that dress is fully becoming the dress that it was designed to be in this moment. Um, and so there's just, just incredible joy in that movie overall, but particularly in that scene. The, the topper is, um, they're dancing to Irving Berlin's Cheek to Cheek. And if you know that song, you know there's the, the phrase, heaven, I'm in heaven, um, which is you know probably what pointed me mostly in this direction and want to include Top Hat uh, as a prayer of joy. So we can move ahead. We're gonna to have to skip another part, I'm afraid. Um, I wanted to dig into Toy Story as a prayer of confession. I, I apologize for having to take away a chance to watch a Toy Story scene from you. That's just not fair. Um, we'll move past this uh, because we are almost at the end of our time for this session. One thing to consider is if there is a movie that functions as a prayer for you. Think about that. Maybe as I was talking, uh, one of your favorite films popped to mind. Uh, I have here a list of movies that I mentioned, some just in passing in the book, but how they might relate to types of prayer. Um, but think about some others that might, um, might come to mind for you. We're here to talk um, right now about the Oscars, this year's Oscars and the films being um, focused on there. So I thought maybe it'd be helpful. I hope this is helpful. Uh, to give a little bit of background first on the Oscars. Basically, who votes for the Oscars? How do they vote? Some of you might know this if you're if you're real Oscar fanatics, but it's something I almost every year have to remind myself of because it's a little convoluted. So let me run through a couple of these uh, these facts with you just to kind of frame our conversation. Variety, um, this comes from Variety, a really helpful December, uh, or I think it was February of last year article. Um, that kind of breaks some of this down. Interesting to note that there's there's not even 10,000 Oscar voters. I don't know, that seems like a low number uh, to me. And it's actually increased in recent years. So the people who belong to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, that's the actual name of the voting group, um, it was about 6,000 in 2015. So they've definitely increased in number. And what's important to note about that is they've increased in diversity in that time. That has been um, you know, a, a stated goal. And so that means diversity of age um, as well as gender, race, ethnicity. Um, and I think you can see uh, some of the results of that in recent nominations in the last few years. Um, so that's been a recent change for the Oscars. When you look at how the Academy is set up, there are 17 branches based on the different um, areas of filmmaking. And that means that each branch, when it comes to the nominations, chooses the nominees for their own category, which is really smart because as it says here, you have editors nominating editors. People who know their craft well will recognize when it's being done well in films and can honor that. Um, now, a catch is that everyone gets to nominate a best picture uh, candidate. So it does open up for that. And then it also opens up once the nominees have been determined and you get they get that final ballot, um, all members vote for all categories, okay? So it's, it's narrowly focused at the beginning um, to kind of really get the experts a chance to weigh in and, and set the field there, and then it opens up. As far as who belongs to the Academy, um, you could apply if you um, if you have a feature film credit. So uh, the only catch is that uh, the candidate has to be approved by those branches, by the executive committees, and then that goes up to the board. Um, so a lot of times invitations are sent out. I think that's how the, the membership was broadened in recent years is they did send out specific invitations to those who would help diversify uh, their representation. Now for best picture, the big one, um, gets a little complicated. And you may have noticed in recent years, the number of Best Picture nominees has kind of changed how many there were each year. Um, right now, 
you could have between five and 10. Um, and so, you know, years past, it used to always be five. Uh, but recently it's been five to 10. The way it works for the nominations is that um, the voters rank their top choices for best picture. Um, and that way, you know, a film, it has to get 5% of first place votes to qualify. Um, so again, this is trying to, they initially tried to do this to kind of broaden the range of interest in the telecast, honestly, um, to not just get these films that not many people have heard of, but to bring in some more popular films um, and try to strike a balance there of those that are maybe the most critically lauded, but also ones that um, the movie going public in general appreciated and is also being honored by these branches. So that's how it is basically for who votes. Uh, there, there are a lot of other nooks and crannies we could explore, but hopefully that gives you a basic uh, roadmap for how we get to what actually happens on Oscar night. Now, as far as who is nominated, I'll take a moment here to plug the podcast that uh, I do on the side. I'm co-host of the Film Spotting podcast, and our most recent show is a fun one we do every year. It's our Oscar preview, and we say who we think of the nominees should win. Um, we predict who will win. Do not use those predictions for any sort of um, you know betting you may or may not do. We, we are not experts to that degree, uh, but we try to predict. But then we also say who we think should have been nominated, um, who was snubbed, so to speak. And then to make it hard on ourselves, I like this part. Um, we also say, okay, if we're gonna say this person should have been nominated, we're gonna have to take somebody out uh, of the group of nominees uh, to make it fair. And so uh, that's a show we do every year in Film Spotting. And we bring in our, our friend from the Chicago Tribune, film critic, Michael Phillips, and he joins us, me and my co-host, Adam Kempinar. Uh, and that's the latest show, if that sounds like something you might want to check out. So I'm not going to go through all the nominees here, but just give you a basic breakdown of, uh, of the films that will be up for this year's awards. Uh, best Picture, we have The Father. This is the Anthony Hopkins drama playing a man suffering from dementia. Uh, Judas and the Black Messiah is a relatively recent release, sort of a biopic of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton, but really traces his final days before he was killed uh, by police in Chicago, um, Judas and the Black Messiah. And then we have Mank, which is leading, I think, with 10 nominations. The David Fincher directed, again, sort of biopic of Citizen Kane screenwriter Herman Mankiewicz. Minari, this is a, a small film, an independent film that managed to get a Best Picture nod um, it follows a Korean American family uh, who moves to start a farm in 1980s Arkansas. Nomadland is another small film, but from what I understand, considered the front runner uh, from director Chloe Zhao, stars Frances McDormand as a woman who uh, takes to moving around, living in her van after the death of her husband and when the factory she works at closes and shuts down. Promising Young Woman, this came up in my breakout session. I believe it's a film about to open or soon will be opening for you in the UK. Um, it's directed by, written and directed by Emerald Fennell, who is um, Camilla, plays Camilla in The Crown. For those of you who watch The Crown, this is her writing, directing debut. I guess it could be described as a, um, a sexual assault revenge drama, um, but it's not as grim as that sounds which is, again, probably doesn't make sense. It's very um, poppy in its aesthetic and its approach. Uh, it's been a very controversial film here, here in the States, uh, but did get a Best Picture nod. Sound of Metal, we're going to spend a little more detailed time on, so I'll get to that in a bit. And then the last Best, best Picture nominee here, The Trial of the Chicago 7, historical courtroom drama from Aaron Sorkin. Uh, quickly, a couple other categories here. Uh, for directing, Thomas Vinterberg um, for, I believe, a, a Danish film. I believe he's a Danish director. So interesting that he got a nod here. Um, his picture, Another Round, uh, did not get a Best Picture nomination, but he got one for directing. Manx, David Fincher is in the mix. Minari's Lee Isaac Chung there. Nomadland's Chloe Zhao. And as I said, Emerald Fennel for Promising Young Woman. So it almost happens every year where one of the directing nominees um, isn't represented also in the Best Picture. Uh, lineup, and that's the case here as well. We'll move into just the two main acting categories, and you can see here that Viola Davis is back, very familiar um, to Oscar ceremonies with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. 
Andre Day, a new face um, for playing Billie Holiday in the United States versus Billie Holiday. We have another Crown alum here, Vanessa Kirby, um, has been nominated for Pieces of a Woman, Frances McDormand in Nomadland, and then Carrie Mulligan is the star of Promising Young Woman. Uh, one more category here, acting, uh, best actor. Riz Ahmed for Sound of Metal, which we'll get to. Chadwick Boseman, uh, also for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, his last tragically screen performance uh, before his death. Anthony Hopkins is nominated for The Father and Gary Oldman for Mank. And then I, I was glad to see this one, Stephen Young uh, for Minari. He plays the father of the, the young couple uh, in that film and gives just a fantastic performance. So those are some of the major nominees um, we can look forward to. Let's go back to talking about movies as, uh, as prayers and spend some time here on, on Sound of Metal. I do wanna talk about this. Also, alongside Toy Story, very different film, as a prayer of confession. Uh, now, I do believe this just became available in the UK recently, so some of you may have seen it, but if you haven't gotten to it yet, uh, the basic plot is uh, it follows a rock drummer played by Riz Ahmed there, Best Actor nominee, um, who's also a recovering addict. Uh, and at the beginning of the film, he loses his hearing um, and ends up going on this, this journey of, of truly learning to give up control. Um, we'll watch the trailer here for Sound of Metal. You sound great. Yeah, right. What? You're telling me you weren't feeling it? You were in it. We don't, need to, we don't need to put them all out. I know, but we just need to film it. hearing is deteriorating rapidly. We'll come back. Till then, Lou, we just keep going, okay? No. Lou, no. let's play tomorrow. Let's see what it's like, okay? I'm gonna be like a click track. You can play it in me. You have to understand your first responsibility is to preserve the hearing you have. I can't hear you. Do you understand me? I can't. I'm deaf. I'm deaf. I'm deaf. Found a place. I think it's important that you stay here with us right now, Ruben. We're looking for a solution to, to this. Not this. I need you to wait for me, okay? You're in for me. Lou, you're my part. You're in for me, okay? You gotta wait for me. does keep moving it can be a damn cruel place but those moments of stillness So just from that trailer alone, um, probably won't be surprised to, to learn that Sound of Metal did get a Best Sound nomination as well, in addition to a number of others. Um, but how does it work? How might it work as, uh, as a prayer of confession? You know, the, the heart of Christian confession is, is not necessarily just listing what we've done wrong. I think that's kind of our instinct, um, right? We think of the confession booth and, and we think of um, bringing these lists, um, these regrets, but really, you know, it's a deeper thing. It, the, at the root of it is more this admission that um, we're not our own saviors, that we aren't gods, that we rather belong to a God 
who loves us despite those sins. Um, and so getting to a point of confessing that um, is really at the root of it. All those things we might list um, kind of grow out of that misunderstanding uh, of, our, of our true identity, but it is um, the root confession is to confess that we are children of God. It's interesting, it's not um, in the trailer that we just saw, but we hear from uh, the man who runs that community where Reuben, the drummer, goes to, the, the community of, of recovering addicts who also happen to have uh, hearing challenges. And um, he talks about the stillness and he talks about this place um, where things are radiant. In the movie itself, he actually describes it as the kingdom of God. Um, they, they leave that out of the trailer for whatever reason, uh, but that's sort of the context it has in the film. And the man, uh, the actor playing that character, Paul Racy, he's also been nominated, by the way, for an Oscar in a supporting actor category. Um, but yeah, he just, he invites Ruben, uh, the drummer, to just lay down his attempts to fix everything and to surrender to his fallibility, to, to confess that fallibility uh, and confess that he needs help. This isn't something he can fix on his own. Um, and I want to share a quote from a book that was really helpful to me as I was writing the chapter about movies as prayers of confession. Uh, it's a book by Ken Fleach, and it's called True Prayer. And he wrote this, we need to go deeper than simply going through a list of personal violations of rules, looking more closely at the corruption of the will than at the particular external acts committed. Sin does not consist only in transgression of external laws, but in an inner alienation of the personality of God. And so with that in mind, you know, I think confession on screen, it's going to look, it's not going to look like characters just stating what they did wrong or, or even being punished for that. Um, you know, those aren't necessarily confessional movies. It's more like characters admitting that they're, um, they're not the perfect people they might claim to be, uh, but that they're instead something broken, something in need, something, um, someone who might need to surrender the way that Ruben learns to in the film. So I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away, but Sound of Metal ends on um, a really beautiful moment of surrender and maybe my favorite movie ending um, of last year. So um, going back to the other, um, the other Best Picture nominees, I wonder, and I haven't sat down and really given too much thought of this. I have some brief sketches, conversation starters really, um, but I wonder if some of these other movies might also be seen as, as prayers in some ways. Promising Young Woman, as I mentioned, the difficult subject matter, there's definitely an undercurrent of anger in that film, uh, despite the, the sort of frivolous aesthetics it has. And so I did think about that as a prayer of anger. Um, I devote a chapter in the book to prayers of anger, which I do think are distinct from prayers of lament, which lament offers things up to God in hope that he can take it over. And uh, prayers of anger are more despairing. So I could see Promising Young Woman being considered something like that. The Father, similarly, perhaps a prayer of anger. That that brings both Anthony Hopkins' character and the loved ones around him to, to real anger, but it's also a lament in some ways. So uh, that could maybe be seen in either direction. Nina Ri, I won't give too much away, but um, when it comes to the central marriage, maybe a prayer of reconciliation. Depends how you interpret that. Um, Judas and the Black... Uh, Messiah is definitely a prayer of lament in the way it marks uh, the end of Fred Hampton's life. Confession, maybe. Uh, I think it's interesting if you think about um, the Judas character played by Lakeith Stanfield uh, in the film uh, who was recruited by the FBI to infiltrate the Black Panthers and really led to Hampton's death. Whether or not that character offers confession in the film is a, is a matter of debate. Uh, and then Nomadland, I think you can think of as a prayer of praise, spend so much time uh, recognizing the goodness of creation that Francis McDormand's character drives through. Um, also, I think a prayer of yearning in some ways. This is a woman who, um, who is still seeking something uh, in this lifestyle that she embraces. So again, those are just starting points. Some of those films which you have seen, maybe um, one of those options resonates more with you than the others, um, but uh, good ways, not the only ways, but good ways to maybe think about some of these best picture nominees. Um, I think it's been absolutely fantastic and I'm really excited to get into this Q and A, which I have not prepped Josh for whatsoever. So hopefully um, 
uh, well, I'm not even going to hope. I already know he's got the skills to back up everything that he's been talking about. So let's let's dive in. So Josh, if you want to unmute, I'll uh, I'll start firing at you some of the top questions that have come in. All right, let's do it. Um, the first one is: Are there any questions which you often ask yourself or ask God after watching a film? Yes, I think that's you know in general that's part of the process of just experiencing a film, even if you're not a critic, right? We're we're having that conversation in our heads, um, but I will say they aren't always the same questions or specific questions because it kind of goes back to the idea of um, of letting the culture speak first. Uh, I don't want to have my checklist of questions. I've often thought about this that I go into a movie with, you know, like the movie is for me to like this movie, it must do these things, for example. Um, and I've never thought about it this way, but it's a good question because it gets me thinking about it. Um, I don't want to leave a movie like that either. <clears throat> so leave a movie already having my, my framework set. Um, now that doesn't mean, you know, again, to bring discernment back into this, I think this, you kind of have your foundational understanding as a person of faith of what your worldview is, how, how you think about these things. Um, and you're going to bring that into conversation with the movie. That's part of your processing. But in terms of, you know, specific questions or topics, I kind of want the, to see what the movie brings. Mm. And just to, to run with that, if you are watching a film with others, uh, what what questions do you find yourself asking or or pondering on in a group setting if you've maybe watched a film and want to have a conversation about it? That's that's the fun part, right? I mean, that's that's why podcasts have exploded because it's people doing that and just recording it, and you're kind of bouncing bouncing things off each other, and it, it's going to depend on who you see that movie with, um, you know. So for for film spotting, that's for a mainstream audience. So when myself and my and, and the co-host Adam Kempinar, when we talk about it, we're going to more address issues that um, mainstream cinephiles might be interested in. But now Think Christian, there's a rotating um, panel of guests who are on that show. Um, we are specifically going to zero in and have a conversation about, um, for example, back to Godzilla. Um, how does Godzilla compare to the Leviathan in Job 41? There are obvious biblical parallels there. We're going to devote a whole show to that. It won't, it won't come up at all in film spotting, but um, we're going to devote a whole show to it on the Think Christian podcast. So, so yeah, it depends who you're with and what sort of conversation you have. If you're leading a, um, a youth group, a high school you know, ministry, that's often what those groups will do. will go to the movies is, um, uh, you know, what does it mean to those kids? And I think th those are very tricky things because you've got to, um, let the kids talk first about what the movies mean to them and what they took from it, mm -hmm. and then kind of bring your faith framework to that, um, which can be a tricky thing. So, so yeah, it's going to be determined by uh, who you've seen that film with. Mm. Great, thanks. Okay, so we've talked about how movies are created as acts of prayer, knowingly or not. Um, this person has asked, how can I make sure that I engage with movies as prayer or prayerfully? Yeah, I mean, first off, you don't have to. This is just, you know, th this was just like kind of one framework for for how we could think about movies specifically from a Christian perspective. Um, but if the larger question is, you know, how can I um, approach a movie as a person of faith and make sure I'm not turning off that section of my my being when I go into a movie, um, I think you, I think it's right to be intentional about it because even though it's even part of my job, my day job is essentially to do this. I can go to a film and get lost in that movie. That uh, Movies are so powerful and immersive and um, the experience is, is all consuming that I almost have to, to make sure I'm keeping, it's a delicate balance. I'm keeping a part of my um, processing open to how this story might fit in with God's larger story, how it might reflect um, some part of the salvation story. And then if I, if I see an inkling of that, then I can start to look for how do some of the elements of the filmmaking from the cinematography to the production design. So I guess it's more about just, you know, being open to that possibility, not expecting every movie to offer that, um, but also not 
turning your your um, spiritual self off to the degree where you're not going to uh, allow that there might be something like that in there. It's it's kind of a delicate balancing act that I still find difficult. My um, most recent discovery on this was um, listening to a monk called David Stendhal Rast speak about gratitude and prayer. He's actually done a TED talk on gratitude. I think he's the only monk that's ever done a TED talk. And he said, um, we often think about prayer as the lifting up of heart and mind to God. So anything that lifts up your heart and mind to God could be a prayer. And so for me to enter into uh, an experience with a film and just to enjoy it and allow me, allow it to touch me, do something in me, that can be a prayer in and of itself. Not to, not to over like cognitize it and think about it too much to turn it into a prayer, but just to enjoy it for what it is. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Does that resonate? Oh, absolutely. It does. I mean, it, it speaks to why, you know, I really do believe prayer is universal, um, th that everyone prays. But also it can speak to when a movie is really working in this way. And I've had pushback on this, that, you know, this is where we should draw the sacred secular divide. We can <laughs> say, okay, a movie might function as a prayer. You can interpret a movie as a prayer. Okay. That's one thing. But to say it's actually praying um, is a step beyond. Yet at the same time, if you watch something like Terrence Malick's uh, The Tree of Life, if any of you have seen that, and there's the um, the somewhat notorious creation sequence where this movie that is about a family in 1950s Texas um, seems to be just this poetic family drama suddenly steps into the cosmos and for some 11 minutes is just going to immerse us in, um, you know, the birth of the universe all the way through, um, you know, creatures emerging from the water on earth. That is, to me, completely is the experience. It's one of the first movies that kind of gave me the sense that the book might work. Um, watching that can be a prayer of praise um, because this is just, you're, you're just feeling the awe. It's a way, you know, you can read Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis and get some idea of what um, that's trying to capture. But the tree of life, that sequence makes Genesis come alive. It, it's mm -hmm. like, you're, you're sitting there watching it happen mm -hmm. in, in, in awe. And that to me, you know, is as legitimate of a prayer uh, as something you might offer in church. Mm, even the dinosaur. Oh, I love the dinosaur. <laughs> but the, di well, you know, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get off track here, but the yeah, dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Like, where, I have to, where, I have where to did, not make this the conversation between Tim and Joshua. I just Is the dinosaur the fall? Is the, yeah. you know, yeah. It's all in there. Okay, so next question. You see certain seasons of common themes in films. So what visual trends or subjects within film do you think are current and what might be upcoming? Well, the visual trend right now isn't so much what's happening on the screen um, visually, but what is the screen visually? And this is something I have a very tortured relationship with because you know the reason I'm such a film fanatic is for that experience of being in a big dark room with other people where you're concentrated on this massive space uh, on which these images are projected. That is the essence of uh, movie going for me. At the same time, I became an Alfred Hitchcock fan as a kid because my grandpa had given me some ancient now piece of technology that was like a little TV. The screen was maybe like nine, I don't know, like nine inches, if that. Uh, and so in my room, I would watch the local television station that would broadcast Hitchcock movies um, on that small screen. There is no way I could understand um, what was going on, the, the genius of Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> on that little screen, but something got through. And so while I'm very pure about how I want to watch a movie, ideally, I'm also not a purist, whereas like, I understand that's the only way. So now jump ahead today. And in this year of pandemic, when most theaters are closed and those of us even who wanted to be purists couldn't be. So are we not going to watch movies on our, let's not even talk about our home televisions, but our laptops, our iPads, going back to where I was as a kid, our phones, <laughs> those couple of inches. Um, I think that is the real question today is, um, is that a desecration of the experience? Um, if, you know, is it somewhere in between and the other element of that is accessibility. You know, I, I can lament that people are watching things on YouTube, but then again, if I, as someone growing up as a kid who loved movies that much, had the access via streaming services and YouTube to all of these older films, 
that would have been wonderful. That would have been amazing. So that's a, a great aspect of it. But I do worry, is that theatrical experience post-pandemic um, in danger of being lost completely? Hmm. Yeah, good one to ponder on. And well, we'll see. I think cinemas are due to open here next month. So and okay. Godzilla versus Kong is uh, is top billing for a lot of places because that's the kind of film that you want to see in the cinema. Right. Although I also yeah. think that actually the Oscars this year reflect the fact that people haven't been in cinemas in a really great way. There's lots of films that would nowhere would have come nowhere near these nominations had they not had the exposure that they've had because people haven't been going to cinemas. They've been watching stuff on Prime and on Netflix. So. Yep. Something Very to true. S S Sound of Metal. I don't is a, is a yeah. case of one of those films. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, another popular question is, how can we best engage with movies that do have difficult content? So mm, I guess, do yeah. you have any, any mm. strategies or approaches um, to that? And yeah. I'll, I'll just, I wonder if there's any particular examples of that. I noticed you'd written a review of St. Maud on your site that I think is a film that got, picked up a lot of acclaim last year, but deals with some very dark and intense subject matter. So when you're approaching a film like St. Maud, perhaps, how do you best engage with that? Yeah, I, I think I go, I'll go back to wanting to be very clear that discernment is personal. And so um, it, it's really if, you know, if a movie that deals with things like St. Maud does, religious fervor or, um, you know, possession, you can argue what's going on in that movie. If those are sorts of things that, um, you know, you find difficult or troubling, it doesn't make you less cultured uh, to step aside from that. Um, so to be to be to recognize that discernment is personal, but also um, you just have to be honest with yourself, which is really hard, I think, when it comes to movies. And I think this is related to the screen comment um, going to be more difficult as our watching of movies becomes more singular and private. Um, because I think there's a communal aspect to discernment that is crucial. Now, I, partly because of, it's my job, you know, I, and partly because I love movies so much, I am not naturally very discerning. Um, I'll admit that. I am forced to be personally, but partly by my job, by Think Christian, because that's kind of the, that's the task, right? Is now I'm going to watch this movie and think about, you know, how it be, can be considered, particularly from a faith perspective. But I would also say for someone who's not in my position, um, discernment should be done in community. And that can mean a variety of things. It can mean a church movie group, perhaps, where you tackle some of those difficult um, films together. Mm. Um, it can mean your spouse or your partner, uh, someone who's going to call you on it. I mean, I've had uh, more than a couple of times something I'm watching for work that my wife is watching and she'll, she'll just say, why are you watching this? <laughs> you know, which is obviously usually that means it's not working for her, but it's also a very, it's a very good question. That's the question we should ask. Why are we watching this? Like, what, what are we, what are we getting out of this? And what might not be, um, might those reasons not, might not be ones that resonate with who we want to be as a person of faith. Mm -hmm. So because we deceive ourselves on <laughs> these sorts of things that we like to lie to ourselves. Um, I, I think it's very important to do discernment in community, however you can. Mm, great. I have <clears throat> been asked, why are you watching this many times by my wife? No, I can that. <laughs> Next question, perhaps a bit more of a personal one. Lots of people keen to know uh, which movie has most profoundly impacted you and why? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's a it's a common question. It is kind of a variation on the you know favorite movie of all time mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. um, but profoundly affected is a little different. Um, you know, I'm gonna one movie that hasn't come up because it wasn't eligible um, for Oscars, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with is uh, Lovers Rock. That's where some of the music came from that we were listening to. It's the Steve McQueen directed um, anthology of films, five films actually, the Small Axe anthology. And Lovers Rock is the second one. Um, that was my favorite of last year, just um, profoundly affecting as an experience. It takes place over the course of one evening at a 1980s London house party in a um, Caribbean immigrant community in London. And um, yeah, just affecting as a, um, a musical experience, but also as a cultural experience to, um, 
to be educated on what the black experience in the UK has been, which is something um, I, I know very little about, partly because it's something that much of cinema has paid very little attention to. Um, and so that's probably, probably the most affecting movie that I saw last year. I think in a very different aesthetic vein, but a similar one would be my second favorite film of last year, Up for an Oscar, Pixar's Soul. I don't know mm -hmm. where that is in terms of UK release, but um, yeah, we've got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I just thought that was a wonderful affirmation of um, the goodness of life. Um, maybe I appreciate it after a horrible year <laughs> that we've all shared, mm. uh, but that life can be good as well. Um, and it relates to, you know, recognizing God's gifts in, in everyday, uh, everyday life, but also in creation, gift of music, gift of jazz. Um, there's a lot in soul that I found very affirming um, and resonated with. And that, that mm. movie surprised me how much that one affected me, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's a good word. Um, as I mentioned, quite a few people have asked about Toy Story. I'm not sure we have time to do the whole point justice, but is it, do you reference uh, Buzz Lightyear's confession in the book? Yeah. Okay, yep. so this is Definitely. an excellent plug. <laughs> It is, and uh, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, it's been a while now, I think the, conf the chapter on confession is bookended by the scene I was gonna show, um, but it is the one you probably all remember where Buzz Lightyear watches the television commercial for mm. the Buzz Lightyear toys. And it's essentially his moment of acknowledgement on a very narrative practical level. He's not a space ranger, <laughs> he's, mm. he's really a toy and just how that is just this beautiful metaphor. Um, similar to what I was talking about when I talked about confession in terms of sound of metal is just being honest about who we are as children of God, broken, mm. um, unable, unable to be heroes, uh, unable to be space rangers. There's so many great animated details that resonate with this um, in Toy Story, including if you remember Andy, the boy who um, gets Buzz for his birthday, writes his name on Buzz's foot. And, you know, we can get into, does that make Andy a God figure? I don't know if it's meant to be that way, but I think it does resonate for us as people of faith, um, the idea of being claimed. Um, mm -hmm. It also resonates with this idea of who Buzz's identity is. Um, and, um, and we can trace throughout that movie, you know, we think of it as, as uh, uh, not necessarily Buzz's movie, but a lot of ways it is. It's his coming to a realization and confession um, mm -hmm. that he's a toy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's really a moment of, um, revelation for him in Toy Story. Josh, fantastic. Thank you so much for all you've shared this evening. We hugely appreciate it. And I'm sure if we were in a physical room, there'd be a huge round of applause for you. Um, for tonight, we'll have to do with the Sound of Metal style death applause. <laughs> so thank you. Um, for everyone who wants to check out Josh's work some more, then um, he's mentioned a few places tonight that you can go to. So uh, there's the Think Christian, podcast and website that Josh hosts there. I confess I listened to the episode on the Velocipaster and I wasn't sure what was going on and what I was listening to but um, I was somewhat intrigued by Velocipaster. There's um, uh, Josh's other uh, podcast Film Spotting which uh, was mentioned and um, I think it's just I, I, would, I would celebrate Film Spotting as a brilliant example of how a Christian can show up um, at work and do their job really well to the glory of God. So Josh, I just want to affirm you in that place and the good work that you do there. Um, Josh is on Twitter. You can check out his website, larsononfilm.com um, and uh, all the other usual ways. So do stay in touch with Josh. I think that's all I have to say. So Josh, I'd love you to give us the final word if you wouldn't mind praying and we can all say a big amen before heading our separate ways. Thanks. Let's do that together. Dear God. We pray for your presence in our theaters, in our homes, wherever we participate in one of your great gifts, the art of cinema. Receive the praise of something like Avatar. Answer the yearning of the life aquatic with Steve Zissou. Hear the lament of 12 years a slave. Be merciful in the face of James Dean's anger. Accept Buzz Lightyear's confession. Bless the tentative reconciliation of do the right thing. Encourage George Bailey as he obeys. Meet Buster Keaton in meditation. Stoke Fred and Ginger's joy. Thank you for the movies, Lord, and the talents you've given to those who make them. We ask for your guidance so that we may watch and pray with a wisdom and grace that honors you. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen.